Until Dawn is a true lightning in a bottle moment. It released at pretty much exactly the right time into the right climate to become the success it is now. Releasing in August of 2015, Until Dawn would become the top trending game on YouTube less than one month later in September. Horror gaming was huge on YouTube at the time. The game released almost exactly two years after PewDiePie became the most subscribed channel and almost exactly one year after Markiplier dropped his now iconic Five Nights at Freddy's video. Creators Supermassive Games have been chasing the high of Until Dawn since it released. They attempted to make it four more times with the Dark Pictures Anthology games, which are mixed in quality, in my opinion, and they also released The Quarry in 2022, which according to some reports began development as an Until Dawn sequel. Now, in 2024, there is a movie in the works as well as a PS5 remaster slash remake coming out, so why does everyone love this game? Although it was the zeitgeist of 2015 that really pushed this game forward, I believe it has had continued success for two reasons. The first one is how well it balances tone, being both dark, intriguing, psychological and horrifying, but also just straight up goofy. It was just a prank, Han. The other reason for the game's success are the core cool cast. They are interesting, multifaceted characters, and you could tell me any of the eight main characters is your favourite, and I would believe you, unless you said Ashley or Matt, in which case I probably wouldn't. So hey, good morning. Today we're going to be talking about Until Dawn. I'm going to be going over the main plot, just in case you haven't played it in a while, and then talking in more detail about each of the main characters and understanding why they work. If at any point you find yourself enjoying the video, please click all of the buttons below apart from the thumbs down one because that hurts my feelings, and then we can all be good friends. Until Dawn is the story of Blackwood Mountain and the Curse of the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a spirit or mythical creature associated with the belief systems of various Native American peoples. A lot of what we understand about it, including how we pronounce the word, comes from the Ojibwe tribe, but it is also believed in by the Cree, the Nascapi, and the Innu. The Wendigo is a spirit or creature often associated with cannibalism and winter, being something that a human being can be possessed by or turn into when indulging in cannibalism. It is more of a cautionary tale, at least that's what a lot of people believe, but as with all mythology, it doesn't really have a straightforward story, description, or origin, it's just kind of something that a lot of people happen to believe. Whilst Blackwood Mountain is fictional, the Cree peoples are very real and the game takes a lot of inspiration from their own mythology, the concept of the Wendigo being a spirit that can inhabit someone rather than just this infection you get is a Cree belief or at least one of the beliefs held by some Cree people, traditionally. The game also stays true to the traditional depiction of the Wendigo as a gaunt, sallow human, rather than the weird deer creature thing that most of us are used to. Um, that is a creation from the 20th century, came up with by English writer Algernon Blackwood, and is a kind of colonial slash post-colonial interpretation of Native American people. The story of Until Dawn begins over a hundred years before the start of the game, when miners arrive in 1893 and begin mining Blackwood Mountain for tin. The Cree people say that this has awoken the Wendigo spirit. The early 20th century sees a settlement of Blackwood Mountain, with Blackwood Pines being established and a sanatorium being built in it in 1922. The spirit of the Wendigo lies dormant until 1952, when several miners are trapped following a cave-in, and 12 of them resort to cannibalism. These miners are placed in the Blackwood Pine Sanatorium for monitoring and gradually deteriorate into Wendigo before attacking and killing all of the staff. In this time, the doctors are researching the Wendigo, they even keep one of their heads in a jar. In the 1990s, movie director Bob Washington buys land in Blackwood Pines and creates the Washington Lodge as a winter getaway for his family, his wife Melinda, and his three children Josh, Beth, and Hannah Washington. Over the years, Bob and Melinda stop using the lodge as much, with Melinda getting fearful of homeless people who are basically squatting in and around the area, but Josh and his sisters still use it as a getaway, and in 2014 they decide to throw a winter party. Seven friends of the family are invited to this get-together, including Hannah's crush Mike and her best friend Sam, and Josh's best friend Chris. As stated before, Hannah has a huge crush on Mike, so Mike's girlfriend Emily and her friend Jess decide to play a prank on Hannah, inviting her upstairs under the guise of her getting with Mike, and then filming her as she's taking her clothes off. This, understandably, is very upsetting, so Hannah flees the house, as does her sister Beth, and the two of them end up falling off a cliff and dying. 
Except Hannah doesn't die, she survives, spends several days starving down in the mines before digging up her sister Beth and cannibalizing her, thus awakening the spirit of the Wendigo within herself. Exactly one year later, Josh invites everyone back up to the mountain to do a reunion party. His reasoning for this is quite interesting and multi-layered, but for the most part he's just hoping to scare them all and show them what his sister went through with a very over-the-top and expensive serial killer prank. Except, when everyone starts freaking out and running all over the mountain, there are Wendigo there. So it's actually a lot more dangerous than he believes, and all eight characters must survive... Till dawn. From here the story is in the hands of the player, and you can get endings where all eight characters are alive, or all eight characters are dead, and anywhere in between. So now I think it's best to take a look at each individual character in the order we play as them, analyze them, their potential deaths, their personality, and what they've done to make this game so iconic. What did our naive sister get herself into now? Beth goes straight into B tier if I'm ranking the characters because she's not really a character at all. She has some very stilted line deliveries and she gives you a tutorial on how to do some basic game mechanics and then she dies. She is a plot device more than the person. Every other character following the prologue is introduced with free character traits, and the reason I assume they don't do it in the prologue, other than it looking kind of strange, is that Beth does not have free character traits, unless you count Josh's sister and Hannah's sister as two separate ones, and then you added, like, cares about her family. Conversely, Hannah, really interesting. Not really so much in the prologue when she's just a person, but after becoming Handigo, she is a very compelling main antagonist for the game, who is more than just the mindless monster that some players may find her to be. American environmentalist Winona LaDuke coined the term Wendigo economics to describe the cannibalistic effect of corporations and capitalism upon the world. You'll note that it's the expansionism of the settlers which was said to awake the Wendigo spirit in the late 19th century, and it is reawakened when the Washington family begin making renovations atop the mountain. The Washington family are more than aware that this land does belong to the Cree people originally. Melinda writes letters to the race and ethnicity department offering to make donations to the elder council of the Cree, but in this very same letter she expressed distaste about having to share the land with anybody. The Washington family are the inheritors of the Wendigo economics which set all of this into motion in the first place, which is why two of the three children can become Wendigo by the end of the game. But critiques of capitalism are not really what make Hannah interesting, and to be honest not really what I care to talk about, it's just an interesting bit of food for thought. What is most interesting about Hannah is the idea of her becoming a Wendigo as a revenge story, and it's something that is foreshadowed in the opening song of the game. Until Dawn opens with a now iconic rendition of the Appalachian folk song, O oh Death. This song takes the form of a conversation between a sinner and death, with death describing that it is death, and the sinner begging to be allowed to live another year. Hannah can be read as both in this situation. She does survive exactly another year, assuming at least one person survives and the house blows up at the end. And she's also deaf, she is the one who opens the door to heaven or hell for most of the characters. The piece of symbolism most associated with Hannah is the butterfly and it has twofold meaning. The one stated in the game is the concept of the butterfly effect, your actions having unforeseen consequences or seemingly small things snowballing out of control and becoming large. This is very reflective of how a simple prank in the eyes of these people has led to potentially the death of all of them one year later. The butterfly symbolism can even be read as how Hannah's infatuation or even obsession with Mike is what led to the entire game happening. She only gets the butterfly tattoo because a compatibility test informs her that she should do something rash to get the attention of the person she likes. This compatibility test also tells her that running away from home is a way to get the attention of the person she likes, so her fleeing the house may not just be out of embarrassment, it may be a last ditch effort to try and win the affections of Mike. The other common piece of symbolism that butterflies are associated with is transformation. They are creatures that transform from caterpillars following a stage in a cocoon. Her time in the mines could be seen as this cocooning process, and her re-emergence one year later to get her revenge is seen as a transformation. In this sense, she has transformed her role in the song O Death, 
She's no longer the sinner who is begging for another year. She's been granted that and become death. This is where the revenge story begins, because as a Wendigo, Hannah is far from a mindless killing machine, although it may at times appear like that. If decisions are made and the game is approached in a certain way, you can actually see that there's quite a lot of her prior humanity left in there, it's just that she is also a monster that wants to eat you. Hannah Goon hunts in a very specific order, first picking off people who have wronged her the most. The first person she explicitly attacks and potentially kills is Jess, the person who organised the prank against her, and, during the events of the game, Mike's current girlfriend. The first person who sees the Wendigo when you're playing as them is Emily, Mike's ex-girlfriend who also helped orchestrate the prank against her. Handigo will also never kill Mike no matter what decisions the player makes. Hannah's hatred of specifically Emily and Jessica is also revealed through her interactions or potential murders of Ashley. She will only kill Ashley if Ashley investigates Jessica's voice showing empathy for her or if she reveals the truth to Emily about her Wendigo bite that it's harmless. It's whenever she shows any kind of affection towards the two girls that Hannah hates that she will actively make an effort to kill Ashley. Hannah can spare Josh, turning him into a Wendigo so they can be a big monster family, and she will only kill Sam right at the end of the game when Sam is planning to blow up a house and kill Hannah, so that's kind of a it's you or me thing. So she does show some humanity. She can be restrained. She won't attack Josh, Mike, or Sam, except in very specific situations or if certain criteria isn't met. She will randomly attack Chris, and I'm not sure what that's all about. He didn't even take part in the prank against her, and he's Josh's best friend. I guess she just didn't like him, but that's, that's fan canon. My head canon is that she just really didn't like Chris. Whilst Hannah the person, as we see her in the prologue, can go in the B for blank slate tier list, I do think Handigo is an S tier villain. They can recontextualize the game if certain criteria are met and you analyze them from a certain viewpoint, turning it into a revenge story. However, they can also work just as well as a faceless, bloodthirsty monster if the player has no interest in solving mysteries and just wants to run away from a big scary thing. I thought we were close. After his sister's disappeared, he'd come and talk to me. He said I was the only one who understood him. Sam is until Dawn's final girl, she can't be killed until the very, very end of the game, and even then it's pretty difficult to get her killed. Sam is introduced as Hannah's best friend, something we spoke about briefly in the Hannah section, and her three core traits that she is shown to have are diligence, being considerate, and being adventurous. And whilst I don't always agree with these three traits they assign to the characters, all of these fit for Sam. Diligence is defined as being careful and methodical whilst working hard on something, and this is shown in pretty much everything Sam does. She always puts a lot of work, effort, and care into things. She's very attentive. She's very perceptive as well. Sam's second word is considerate, and that is true. She's shown throughout the game to be a peacemaker and a pretty good friend to everyone. She has a pretty fun friendship with Chris that is shown off right at the start of the game, and I wish had more screen time. She develops a close friendship with Josh, having been the best friend of his sister and something of a shoulder to cry on following the passing of his sisters. And at the end of the game, Sam can wait until everyone else is out of the house before deciding to save herself and blow it up. So Sam can put the lives of her friends before herself. She's very considerate, very self-sacrificing. Sam's final trait is adventurous and this is true. She's a rock climber by hobby and this turns into a lot of fun gameplay opportunities. She forms what I want to call the gameplay duo of Until Dawn alongside Mike. These are characters who can't die until right at the end and probably for good reason because although this is supposed to be an interactive movie first and foremost, the most fun gameplay comes out of these two. They are the people who are going to be shooting at stuff, running away from stuff. Most of the, the fun comes from these characters. Sam is the second most playable character tied with Mike, and it's very easy to like her. The fact that she's introduced as Hannah's best friend and the only person who really sticks up for her at the start of the game, and the fact that she finds the most clues in the game, showing that she is a good friend to Hannah even following her passing, she's just easy to like. There's a picture in the game where she is taking Hannah to prom whilst Mike is taking Emily. It's just cute. Sam's closest to the Washington family can be found in so many clues where she's inviting all of them out to Halloween parties or to hang out, and she's also really good at reading Josh. She drops so much foreshadowing in the early chapters about his eventual heel turn. 
Oh, but watch out for that, Josh. He's a schemer. Okay. And, like, I think somehow Josh is involved in all of this. Wait, what? Sam is something of a main character in Until Dawn, as far as you can be to it. She's Hannah's best friend, so has the most involvement in her plotline, she's the most good aligned character, making her quite easy to like, and she has the first and last gameplay segment in the entire game, she also has the final word in the credits. It's for her overall likability and how fun she is to play as that Sam winds up on the top of a lot of people's lists, and for me it's no different, Sam is an S for strong towel tier character. Nice Alright, I'm bad. I'm a badass. Chris is introduced as having a crush on Ashley, but he should be introduced as Josh's best friend. Where almost every other character is very much concerned with the Hannah storyline, Chris had nothing to do with that, and his storyline is all about his friendship with Josh. Chris seems to be where the devs put a lot of focus. He is the most playable protagonist, but he's also one of only three characters who can die and completely miss sections that you could otherwise play. Over the course of the game, Chris goes for a warped coming of age story, being forced to choose between the girl he likes or his best friend in the world. And he's made to make these decisions because his best friend in the world decides to torture him pretty badly. <laughs> now, why Josh does this to Chris we'll cover in Josh's section, but from Chris's perspective, all you need to know is he came to support his best friend on the anniversary of a tragedy and was mentally tortured for it. Chris has my personal favourite line of dialogue in the game, but in order to understand why it's so great we need to build up to it. So let's take a look back at the relationship between Chris and Josh, and why this storyline that Chris goes through is so impactful. In 2014, the year prior to the events, Chris can be seen asleep at the table with Josh. This sets the tone of their friendship, they're always together. If Josh is going to get so drunk he passes out, Chris is going to be right there with him. When Chris is taking the cable car with Sam at the start of the game, he recounts his entire friendship with Josh. He remembers exactly what happened all the way back in third grade. Now this is used to explain the butterfly effect gameplay mechanic, but I think it's sweet how Chris is so eager to reminisce on all the time he spent with his bestie. Chapter 1 also just showcases that Chris has a very good rapport with pretty much anyone, he's capable of cracking jokes with Jess, and with Sam. Him and Sam actually have a really good platonic relationship, which is a rarity male-female platonic relationships get. So little representation, it's crazy. In Chapter 2 we meet Josh, and Chris is one of the first people to talk to him, and it's really easy to see why they're such good friends. They are probably the most similar people to each other in the entire cast, and they have several little inside jokes that they just throw around in conversation. Nope, but I'll do it. Godspeed, Pilgrim. But we can also see the beginnings of a rift in their friendship when Josh makes uncomfortable comments about Ashley, and Chris can tell him to stop. She's like a sleeper hit kind of gal, you know? And I just want to rip that Parker right off of her and make some snow angels, right? In spite of this, Chris and Josh continue to have a good friendship until eventually Josh puts him in the situation where he has to decide if he wants Ashley or Josh to be ripped in half by a saw blade. And no matter what he chooses, Josh gets ripped in half. So Chris has to watch his best friend die, potentially with the added trauma of knowing that he tried to kill the girl he likes, and then his best friend died anyway. The following sections are more about Ashley's trauma around being involved in the death of Hannah, and Chris is very empathetic here. When there is the dollhouse showing the diorama of everyone pulling the prank on Hannah, Chris doesn't say it's you, he says it's us. He had no involvement, but he includes himself so that she feels as though she's not alone in the situation. Chris also persists in looking around a very clearly dangerous lodge because he believes he can help Sam. This again shows how empathetic and caring of other people he is. Following this, Chris and Ashley are captured, and Chris is forced to choose between shooting Ashley or himself. The gun is proven to be fake, but even still, this is really traumatic, and more than likely, I think the more common choice is that Chris chooses to shoot himself. When it's revealed that the killer is a fake and a prank pulled by Josh, Chris is just shocked more than anything, and when he does lush out and attack Josh when he's taking him to the shed alongside Mike, he doesn't hit him because of anything he did to him, he hits him because he hit Ashley. You don't hit a girl! You, you just don't, dude. Dude, Chris. But in spite of all of this treatment, once the real threat of the Wendigo is established, Chris is the one who goes out to try and save Josh. 
in spite of all of the horrible treatment he's received, he still understands that Josh is his friend and he doesn't want him to die. You go out there, Chris. I'm supposed to be his best friend and, and, and I let him down. No, he let you down, Chris. He let all of us down. I don't care. I'm going to get him. That line of dialogue is my favourite in the game because it cuts to the core of Chris's character and it also underpins that Chris's story really has nothing to do with the whole Hannah and Wendigo thing. It's mainly about the fact that his very close friendship with Josh was strained by a tragedy that happened to his sisters and Josh lashing out at Chris damaged it further. And this scene is made all the more powerful not just because it's a touching display of friendship from Chris in spite of all he's been through, it's the fact that he can die here, he's not Sam, he's not Mike, he's not kept alive until the end of the game. There are three separate ways that Chris can die here and one of them is actually Ashley refusing to open the door to let him back in. If Chris does survive this he can get killed by Ashley again if she decides to open the trapdoor or kill himself by opening the trapdoor, but honestly if they're gonna do a movie I think Chris should die when he goes out looking for Josh, I just think it makes sense if you wanna make it bloody and kill off characters and Chris's storyline is all about his friendship with Josh and how because of the actions of other people they have become distant and strained and both of them ultimately meet their demise because of the butterfly effect set in motion by their friendship group. I also think that the loss of Chris really serves to drive home Josh's insanity towards the end of the game and how he completely loses himself to despair. All in all, I love Chris, he's getting a strong A tier from me because as much as I love that one scene, after that they kind of just don't know what to do with him and he can die whilst just loitering, which is kind of ridiculous. We are going to have sex and it's gonna be hot, so enjoy it because I know we're going to. Jess is introduced simply as Mike's new girlfriend and that alone carries so much weight. We saw in the prologue that she conducted and organised the prank on Hannah because she was claiming to be protecting her friend Emily and her relationship, but she broke up Emily and Mike and is now with Mike. She has done exactly what Hannah wanted to do, just more successfully. One of Jess's cool words is confidence, and that is a cruel piece of irony, because if she survives the events of the game, she loses all of that. She loses a defining pillar of who she is. Hannah robs her of some of herself. When we discussed Hannah, I talked about how this could be viewed as a revenge story, and if that's true, Jess is the main villain. She has wronged Hannah twice, thrice actually, but we'll get to that in a bit. But it's hard to view Jess as anything other than a victim. She's mean, she's pretty spiteful, and she comes up with pretty awful schemes to mess with people. But after all she goes through over the course of this game, it's hard to feel anything but sympathy. Before I talk about Jess and Hannah, I need to talk about Jess and Mike, because Mike is the guy all the curls want. He's attractive, he's charismatic, he's popular, and he ends up with Jess. Why? Well, Jess says that she feels as though men only view her for her body, and Mike is shown throughout the game to be pretty horny, but I think there is more to it than that. They do seem to have a genuine connection beyond all of the lewd jokes and teenage horniness. Mike and Jess share several moments of quiet intimacy, and when she is taken by the Wendigo, Mike's reaction shows how deep his care for her is. We see so much in the first few chapters how much Mike and Jess do truly love each other, so whilst in the warped mind of the Handigo, they are killing the person who wronged them, they're actually robbing the person they claim to love of something they love. When Jess and Mike go to the cabin in classic slasher movie setup, we get a good insight into the mind of the Handigo. First off, it has been wronged by Jess twice, so that is the person it goes after. First when Jess pulled the prank, secondly when Jess got with Mike, but it's only when they are wronged a third time that they strike, when Jess talks about how they're going to be sleeping with Mike. It pulls them out of the cabin and runs away with them. Interestingly, it doesn't kill Jess right there. If Mike is quick enough, it will just drop her into the mines. There's quite a few ways you could view this. You could view it as Hannah being ashamed of her new monstrous appearance and not wanting to be seen by Mike, which is why he doesn't see her here, and if he is quick enough, she will drop Jess. However, I view it as a form of twisted revenge. You see, Hannah is totally fine 
killing people as a Wendigo right in front of people. She even kills Josh right in front of Mike. So she's clearly not that concerned with Mike's feelings or seeing her. I view it as a kind of revenge, as I said. They're putting Jess through exactly what Jess put them through, being dragged away from a potential romantic moment with Mike and cast down into the mines to survive for themselves. Jess getting dropped in the mines in Chapter 4 then being revealed as alive in Chapter 10 is I believe one of the game's greatest plot twists and something they should keep in any future adaptations. I also think Jess should survive the night in any kind of future work they make because there's a lot more cruelty in it really. She's put through the exact same fate as what happened to Hannah at her hand and on top of it all she doesn't know why. Jess doesn't find out what happens over the course of the night. She's not present for any of the discussions about Wendigo or curses. She's just a scared girl trying to survive a really, really traumatic night that robs her, as I said earlier, of some of her core personality traits, some of her pillars of self. The Jess only ending, the ending where Jess is the only person who survives the night, is one of the saddest credit roles ever. It's just her trying and failing to explain what happened because she has no understanding and begging for any kind of news about Mike. There's something so bittersweet in this specific credits role when she talks about Mike coming for her being the only thing she remembers. She truly did love him, she didn't orchestrate all of that out of some petty kind of lust. Jess is an A-tier character, she doesn't have that big of a role in the game, but whenever she is on screen it's interesting and she has a lot to say about the themes and overall vibe of the game. She's a simple character done well. I'm trying to understand. Understand the palm of my hand, bitch. <laughs> Emily is S-tier because 50% of her dialogue is hilarious and the other 50% is iconic. First time I played Until Dawn, I didn't really like Emily because I was stupid and dumb and stupid but she's actually the character who gets a lot done, and if you're into a game where choices matter and there's lots of different outcomes, she's really the best character for that. She has the most diverse number of deaths, she can die all over the place really, and she has all kinds of quirky, crazy conversational options with people as well. Emily has the first line of dialogue in the entire game, oh my god I can't believe you actually did this, and she just causes problems from then onwards really. At the point of the prologue, Emily is dating Mike and it's her relationship that sets everything into motion. She also sets everything into motion in the actual game proper because she immediately lies to her new boyfriend Matt, going back to hang out with her old boyfriend Mike, and then gets into a fight with Jess, which causes Jess to go to the cabin, and all of that stuff we just talked about happens. So Emily immediately is something of a catalyst for the drama of the game. I feel like without her, things would go a lot better, and that would be bad, that would be a bad game. Even here, in the earliest chapters of the game, everything Emily says is just really funny. I, I don't know what it is, she's just perfectly written to be this mean, spiteful person. Excuse me? Did you say something? Oh, did you not hear me? Was your sluttiness too loud? That so, it's kind of easy to not like Emily. She is so arrogant and headstrong and she will just argue with anyone over the most minor of things. But that's why the game works. That's why a lot of stuff happens. It's Emily who goes out and actually contacts help so that people can come and rescue them in the morning. She's the reason they only have to hold out until dawn and not until whenever the problem goes away. She spends most of the early game looking around a haunted woods where there is either a serial killer or a wendigo about looking for a designer bag. That's hilarious. Earlier I said one of the main reasons this game works so well is that it balances tone, being able to be simultaneously goofy and silly and serious and dark, and really that balance is just Emily and then everyone else. Emily is all of the silliness and goofiness of Until Dawn, and she's just very easy to love because of that. On top of all of this, there are actual stakes when playing as Emily. She can literally just slip and fall into an ore grinder and die, like it's not even all monster related. She's just very danger prone because she's in all kinds of crazy situations. She's the first person who meets the stranger. She's the first person who actually sees the Wendigo, if you don't count being able to glance it through a scope of a gun when you're playing as Mike. I know as a video essayist, it's my job to try and find hidden and deeper meaning in characters, but Emily doesn't have any and that's great. She is exactly what she says she is, and I think she should be celebrated for that. 
She is such a surface level character. It's phenomenal. And everything she says, does, or is, is iconic. Matt. Matt can die because he randomly attacks a deer and then falls off of a cliff, and for that reason alone he should be in D tier. Matt is a really frustrating character because it seems like they just keep forgetting what they want to do with him. I understand conceptually what he's meant to be, he's Emily's rebound fling who's kind of clingy, and he's cowardly in spite of being a big jock, you know, it's, it's all subversions of tropes and pretty standard horror movie fare but they just forget about him halfway through the game. He suffers the most from the fact that when a character has a potential death after that point, they don't have that much to do. And his potential death is very early, so he just doesn't have a lot to do overall. What frustrates me the most about Matt is that he is introduced as Emily's new boyfriend and that is all he is. He had some involvement in the prank last year, but he doesn't have much to say about it. Him and Emily don't really seem to like each other that much, and he can get into a big fight with her if he sees her hugging Mike. But this fight doesn't really have any resolution, he can just shout at her before falling to his death or abandoning her, and then they talk about each other in the credits a bit. It's something that's a bit more interesting in theory than it is in execution. The other major decision Matt can make is abandoning Jess in the mines if both of them are still alive at that point, but I feel like him even showing up in Jess's story cheapens the impact of it because she's all alone down in the mine, she's going through what she put someone else through, but Matt's there too. Why is Matt there too? Matt's still somewhat interesting for his relationship drama and also for the fact that his cowardice allows him to indirectly kill both Emily and Jess. Emily survives, but in his mind, he's indirectly killed her. So he's got some interesting drama and ideas, but compared to the other characters, he's just not on the same level. Okay, I'm gonna open the door. You ready? You ready? Just do it already. Whoever it is, it's probably gone by now. I, unless you want me to take the gun. No, no, no. I think that's less good. Mike is a survival horror protagonist through and through. He gets the most guns, probably the most shooting galleries in the game. He can kill other protagonists. He even gets the classic dead slash missing wife outfit when Jessica is either dead or goes missing. Mike is a character defined by actions. Though his heart is in the right place, he apologizes to Hannah right after the prank and he is very sweet with characters like Jess. He's also just more than willing to put other people's lives in his hands. One of the most subtle pieces of foreshadowing in the entire game, Mike is shown to have this trait very early when he can potentially kill a wounded deer. This foreshadows how willing he is to make these kinds of life or death decisions for other living beings. It's only a deer now, but later in the game it's Emily, or everyone in the safe room when he decides to open the door and go out on his own. If he comforts the deer, it being pulled away by Hannah can also be seen as a kind of jealousy. Mike is part of the gameplay duo alongside Sam, meaning there's just a lot of fun set pieces with him and he can't die until the very end of the game, so there's very minimal risk. However, a first time player doesn't know this, so his sections can feel very tense, and even when you know he can't die, the understanding that Hannah just isn't going to kill him makes it make a bit of sense. Mike is also how we discover most of the wider lore of Blackwood Pines, whilst it's Sam who discovers the most about the Hannah storyline, it's Mike who discovers the most about the sanatorium and all of the stuff that went on there back in the 1900s. He also gets a cute dog, which is just a massive plus. Uh, the fact that he can kick it is horrible though. Mike is the class president, he's the person in charge of making decisions for everyone and he carries that mentality into these survival situations. However, a lot of the decisions he can make are pretty bad ones. He chooses to throw Josh out into the snow, leading to him being captured by the Wendigo. He can choose to shoot Emily, even though the group have a book in their possession that confirms that Emily is fine, and if they just took a minute to flick through it, they wouldn't even think about doing that. Handigo is the only threat on the mountain, so Mike is fine up until he decides to start shooting up the chained up ones in the asylum, freeing several of them, and allowing him to be killed in the final chapter. He can only die because he decides to completely ignore most of the advice in that book. And all of this is good, because Mike is a character who is very heavily defined by the fact he just does stuff without really thinking about it. He's the one who decides to be used as a pawn in a prank against Hannah, knowing full well how she feels about him. 
He apologizes afterwards, but what speaks louder are his actions. He can decide to do stupid stuff and then regret it afterwards. This is a consistent piece of characterization, which makes him a consistent character. Mike has a really fun little detail where if he shoots at Handigo when they take Jess, they will permanently be wounded. They'll have a little bullet mark on their head. It's just a neat bit of visual storytelling about how Mike has permanently wounded this poor girl. Mike gets an A for action hero because he's good fun to play and pretty consistently written. Go suck an egg. I do not like Ashley, but I think that's kind of the point. She's maybe too well written. As Mike is a character determined by action, Ashley is a character determined by inaction. She will pretty much always take the path of least resistance and go with whatever is easiest for her. She will express some remorse, but usually in quite a half assed way. For instance, with the prank with Hannah, she's seen there, but she's not a major participator, and later when pushed on it, she can say, it's not like I personally made her run off into the woods. Ashley is a interesting character because the player can choose if she is remorseful or just completely doesn't care about what happened to Hannah, but no matter what they decide, she's always going to be horrible towards Emily, being the one who most pushes for her to get shot by Mike, even though she is the one in possession of the book that says that Emily is fine. Similarly, she tells Chris not to go after Josh, even after the threat of the Wendigo has been revealed. So if the player has made her remorseful, Ashley is presented as someone who feels remorse for things but still does bad stuff, and if the player has made her indifferent, Ashley is a sociopath. Probably Ashley's most infamous action is begging Chris to shoot her when he's presented with that decision, but then if he does, she leaves him outside the cabin to die when he goes after Josh. This has been viewed by a lot of people as Ashley being a liar or manipulative, but really I think it's just her being conflicted and unable to make a split second decision due to the amount of stress that she's under. I don't think Ashley's like psychopathic or anything, I just think she's annoying. But again, I don't think any of this is that she's poorly written, I think it's that she's written too well to be this very easily stressed out, easily frightened person who is incapable of making decisions. Ashley is usually a follower, so whenever she's given the option to make a decision, she will usually pick one that's bad. Ashley is introduced as having a crush on Chris, and whilst that's sweet and they do share some sweet moments, the amount of stress put on them by Josh and their ongoing plotline in the lodge means that we don't really get to see this develop and it's not as fleshed out as I think I would like it to be. Ashley goes in B tier because she's well written but I don't like her. <laughs> well, the mountain don't belong to me, it's true. But it don't belong to the Washingtons. This mountain belongs to the Wendigo. The Stranger, also known as Jack, is to Until Dawn what Zadok Allen is to H.P. Lovecraft's book The Shadow Over Innsmouth, in that he is an old man who exposits a bunch of lore and then dies. This character is very tropey, probably more so than any other character, and I've said Until Dawn is a game that is good because of how well it captures the low-budget horror movie vibe and then subverts it a little bit, but this guy's just too much for me. Also, the plot twist of him actually being a good guy is very obvious from the prologue where you can see him shooting flames at whatever's chasing Hannah and Beth and then trying to help them up on the cliff. The fact that he saves Emily, he's really never anything but a good guy, but we see a few ominous shots of him, so, you know, there's a bit of ambiguity. And the Josh plot twist is also obvious, but I love that, as we'll see when I get into my incredibly long number of thoughts about Josh because it recontextualizes so much of the game, it has a lot of depth and possible reasons, whereas this is pretty surface level and just exists so someone can show up and say, hey, there's a Wendigo on the mountain, just to confirm it in case you didn't already know. C tier, much like Beth, he is a plot device on the person, but unlike Beth, we don't have the impact of all that happens to them basically being the catalyst for the entire game. Side note, when googling The Stranger Until Dawn, on the first page of Google there is a Sam X male reader fanfiction, so leave a comment if you want a reading of that. None of them nice. Quit it. <laughs> I'm just, just joshing you. So at this point we're 40 minutes into a video called Why Until Dawn Works, and we haven't really talked about why it works, so... We need to talk about Josh because he's the reason. 
Josh is the defining character of Until Dawn, not just because he goes from main antagonist to something of a victim of his trauma, but because everything he does has numerous interpretations as to why he potentially does it. He's a very complex person who clearly has a lot of thoughts in his head. As I stated at the start of this video, why the game works is the cast overall. Each of these characters could be someone's favorite, even the ones I've bashed probably have huge fan bases who are going to come for me, but Josh is the most realized character, due in part to the brilliant performance by Rami Malek, but also due to the fact that everything he does has so many potential interpretations. So let's talk about him over the course of the game and give many reasons why he does what he does. Josh is introduced in the prologue as Beth's brother who has fallen asleep from drinking. And when we see him properly in the opening cutscene, he's portrayed again as something of a party guy. He talks about having a big party on the anniversary of his sister's disappearance. And when he first talks with Chris, he makes those uncomfortable remarks about Ashley, all showing that he's just that kind of guy. But one of Josh's opening words is complex, and he is. The reason he's passed out at the party is likely due to substance issues brought about by his tendency to self-medicate, something that he's had for a long time, as observed in his patient files. We'll talk more about Josh's mental illness and Dr. Hill and all of that when we cover his hallucinations in chapter 10, but first we need to talk about his prank, why he did it, and why he did it to the people he did it to. So Josh's stated motivation in his big villain reveal speech is that he did the prank because he wanted to get revenge for what happened to his sisters, but there's a bit more to it than that. We learn early on when observing the baseball bat that Josh has a strange relationship with his father, viewing his dad as being too busy to spend time with him doing things they have a shared interest in, like baseball. He orchestrates a horror movie scenario and his dad is a horror movie director. Is that yours? You bet it's mine. I used to play ball with my dad all the time. Of course, that was before he got too busy to hang out with me. Ah, we'll save it for the couch, right? Throughout the game, Josh is seen as very family-centric. He has deep love and care for his sisters and has immense guilt over what happened to them. So this can be seen as some kind of attempt at connecting with a family member. On top of this, this comment here, save it for the couch, is one of the earliest references to Josh's mental health issues. Also, Josh doesn't seem to target people who were that involved in what happened to Hannah and Beth. He targets Chris, who had no part in the prank, Sam, who had no part in it, and Ashley, who had probably the most minimal role out of everyone. And I believe this is because he actually believes himself to be doing a good thing for his friend Chris, as evidenced by quotes like this. They are very sweet together. I wish they'd just freaking get on with it already. I swear, they just need, like, something to bond over, you know, some sort of traumatic event to send them into each other's arms. I mean, at this rate, they'll be in the geriatric ward before Chris makes a move. And this. And what you've done I'm a healer, man! I bring people together! Not like you assholes. This isn't to say that Josh has no negative feelings towards Chris, he actually has quite complex feelings towards him. He feels betrayed if he chooses to kill Josh and save Ashley, as evidenced in the flashback when he's being interrogated, and he can be quite mean to him sometimes. But I think this sense of betrayal only serves to better highlight that Josh is very, very codependent on Chris. He is his best friend, and he gets a lot of validation from being Chris's best friend. He routinely insults Chris's ability to make a move on Ashley, saying that if he doesn't, Mike will. But I think this speaks more to his ideas about Mike. Mike. I mean, at least he's got some notches in his belt, you know? He'll treat her right! Fucking pathetic, Chris! I'm gonna Josh seems to have tried to rationalize Hannah's obsession with Mike by viewing Mike as this pinnacle of manliness and sexiness in an almost uncomfortable way. At the start of the game, he says he wants everyone to party like porn stars, which is a nickname he later gives to Mike. At least twice, he will insult Chris, saying that if he doesn't make a move on Ashley, Mike will. 
One of the first things Josh does in the game is send Mike away to the cabin, something he has premeditated because he has told Mike about the cabin prior to his arrival. He also places a copy of the Kama Sutra in this cabin, again showing his associations between Mike and sex. Prior to sending the couple to the cabin, Josh also jokes about how he would pay to watch Mike have sex. Uh, again, probably meant as a joke, but in the wider context of everything he's saying and thinking, it's almost like he's inherited Hannah's feelings towards Mike as a way of staying close to her, and he also wants to get Mike away from the lodge itself because he is trying to look out for Chris. On top of all these other reasons as to why he chooses Chris, there's also the idea that he might think Chris will just find it funny. Earlier in the game, Chris scares him in a much more light-hearted joke, and Josh high-fives him and says he wish he'd came up with something like that. What was I? Was I not supposed to take advantage of the opportunity? Are you? Are you serious? Were you in on this, putz? <laughs> no, but I, I wish I was. That was too good. Chris and Josh are both characters who make jokes to cope with their own insecurities, but because Josh's insecurities are much, much bigger, his jokes are a lot more extravagant, and this time it really doesn't feel like a joke, he's just traumatizing his best friend. But because Josh is so well realized and so multi-dimensional, it is possible to just take him at face value that he is getting revenge for what happened to his sisters. He may blame Chris for him passing out, seeing him as an enabler who allowed him to indulge in his worst vices, thus being unable to prevent what happened. This also gives some idea as to why he would choose Ashley. She's not just Chris's crush, but she's someone who was involved. And this is just Josh's relationship with Chris. He has similarly complex relationships with a lot of other characters. And this is why I saved him till last, and why I'm calling him the reason the game works. All of the other characters are interesting, but this is just so incredibly layered that it's hard not to just love it. So what about Sam? Why does Josh choose to torment Sam above anyone else? She was Hannah's best friend and had absolutely no involvement in the prank. In fact, she was one of the only people to speak out against it. Well, Josh has very complex feelings towards Sam. As we learn from her credit speech, they got incredibly close following the disappearance of his sisters after Josh emerged from 30 days stay in hospital, something that cost his family over $20,000 to finance. So although Sam was a friend of the family, being Hannah's best friend and someone who would write letters to all of them and invite them to events, it's following the disappearance that Josh really gets close to Sam. He views her as the only one who understands him. And this is true, although he's close with Chris, Sam is the one who can piece together his involvement. Sam is the one who can find the clues of Josh being the psycho. They can put together the plot twist early, and when Josh is revealed, Sam correctly identifies it as a cry for help. Something Josh dismisses, but I think that is what it is. He just wants someone to realize what he's going through. You're crying out for help, Josh. God, you wanted to get caught, didn't you? Oh, sure. I'm totally just crying out for help. Help me! Oh, help me, help, help. Here's the implication that Josh knows what he's doing is self-destructive and he wants someone to sympathize with him, so he chooses Sam because she's the only one who understands that that is what this is. There's also no overlooking the nature of how he chases Sam, chasing her down when she is nude and taking her clothes from her, whilst making several comments about her beauty, stuff that he was doing before he even adopted the psycho persona, in Dr. Hill segments, which are Josh discussing with his subconscious, he often pairs himself with Sam. His romantic feelings for her may have begun long ago, but they may be a way of attempting to reconnect with Hannah. If you'll remember from the Sam section, Sam took Hannah to prom, which is typically a romantic gesture. They were that close. So for Josh, this may be a way of reconnecting with Hannah. Josh has very complex feelings towards Hannah and Beth. He loves them, but he feels as though they wouldn't love him. And that's something we'll come back to when we talk about his final hallucinations. But first, I do want to quickly talk about Dr. Hill. So the real Dr. Hill is someone who does exist. He's Josh's therapist, and he's someone who had contacted Josh prior to the events of the game, 
warning him against doing what he's planning on doing. So he clearly confided in his therapist about doing all of this. However, the Dr. Hill we see in the game, in the gameplay segment, is a figment of Josh's imagination made up to act as his subconscious. And the first hint of this is at the very start of the game, where we can see some of Dr. Hill's advice sprawled out in the clunky red handwriting, which we know later to be Josh's. Through discussions through Dr. Hill, we can understand more about Josh's relationships with other characters, which can actually be influenced by players making decisions in this. For instance, there's what we talked about with Sam, how he often pairs himself with her. There's also the fact that he sees a bit of a kindred spirit in Emily, which is an interesting take on it because she was the person behind a lot of what happened, but he sees her as someone who uses arrogance to mask insecurity, something similar to himself. Most interestingly though, is how Josh views himself, as is shown through these discussions. He calls himself a psychopath. 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 Josh is diagnosed with depression, and these harsh views on himself are likely a result of that. He has incredibly low faith in himself, believing himself to be beyond fixing. You'll know later on from the hallucinations that we're going to get to that he doesn't really blame anyone for what happened to Hannah and Beth apart from himself. He holds himself most accountable. This is why he's not particularly malicious to anyone who was involved in the prank. So to recap up to now, this is why Josh is brilliant in the first half of the game. You can easily see the plot twist coming, but it's the context and his reasoning for it that will keep you guessing. And it also makes a lot of sense as to why a lot of the stuff in the early game is so cliche. A player may be tempted to roll their eyes at the generic psycho killer storyline, but then you understand it's the incredibly disturbed mind of a very traumatized teenage boy who is attempting to replicate the horror movies of his father, 90s horror movies, which are all over the place. But now we've got to talk about Josh in the second half of the game, and this is where he really makes the game special. So the second half of the game sees Josh fully descend into trauma and madness, he just fully loses himself to despair, and this is after Mike accuses him of killing Jess. And Mike and Chris take Josh out to tie him up in a shed to wait until morning. Josh has myriad emotions here, First he denies having killed Jess, but later he just says he doesn't remember doing it, showing that he does think himself capable of maybe doing something like this, he just can't recall actually going through with it, because he didn't do it. Here Josh tries to repeatedly state his good qualities, almost as if assuring himself that he wouldn't do something like this. And what you've done I'm a healer, man! I bring people together! Not like you asshole. He continues his characterization here in trying to make a bunch of jokes to hide the fact that he is clearly having a very severe manic episode. I'm up if you just wiggle around. Gosh, dude. I need me a little wiggle room, huh? What does it take to shut you up? Oh, not so tight, okay? Not so tight, okay? The next time we see Josh is in the final chapter of the game when we finally get to play as him and have a look at what's going on inside his head. His hallucination gives so much insight into how he views himself, how he views his relationships with others, so let's break it down almost frame by frame and talk about why this scene stands out so much. Through medical files, which we can find prior to this, Josh had been prescribed as having depression. However, when we get to see through his eyes, he is more symptomatic of being schizophrenic. Now, depression can cause psychosis, but visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as delusions and frequent dissociation from what is actually happening, is more closely in line with symptoms of schizophrenia. So it's very likely that Josh has been misdiagnosed and thus has not received the proper help for his medical condition. This likely informs Josh's self-image because he has not received proper treatment, but he doesn't know this. He believes himself to be unfixable, hence earlier him referring to himself through the subconscious of 
Dr. Hill as a psychopath. And we see a bit more of it here when he talks about how he's a spoiled brat and he had so many people who loved him, but he messed it all up and he's incredibly harsh on himself. Again, he doesn't say any of this directly. It comes from Dr. Hill, but we know Dr. Hill to be a manifestation of Josh's subconscious. Here, Dr. Hill abandons Josh, and Dr. Hill has been representative of Josh's consciousness, his desire to shout at himself and try to prevent him from doing all the self-destructive things he's doing. Josh has fully given up on a chance of redemption. We then cut to Josh alone in the mind, hearing the voices of everyone he believes he has wronged all around him. He says, not again, which may be a reference to the fact that he has these symptoms recurring often, or may be a reference to the fact that in his hallucinations he often finds himself down in the mind, as we will see later they are a big source of trauma for him. Shortly thereafter, Josh is met by the corpse-like visages of Hannah and Beth. Now, there was no confirmation prior to the events of the game that either of them were dead, it's possible they are still missing somewhere, but in Josh's mind they are dead, and not only that, his inaction is why they are dead. There's foreshadowing for how Josh believes his inaction is what led to the death of his sisters earlier in the game, when there is a note written by Josh's psycho persona about how he, the psycho, had killed Hannah and Beth. That is an unnecessary detail. He did not need to add that to the character to make his prank any more believable or further meet his goals. And as was shown earlier, not all of the letters he writes as the psycho are for the prank because he wrote the advice of Dr. Hill right at the start of the game. So we learn here that Josh has recurring visions being down in the mines, or at very least in similar uncomfortable situations, and he does believe his sisters to be dead a result of his inactions. But there's also popular fan speculation as to how much of this is Josh's mental illness, and how much of it is the Wendigo curse calling to him. In some traditional Wendigo myths, they are able to induce a kind of madness in people, and Josh is affirmed by the ghosts of Hannah and Beth that now they are together, family, he belongs in the mind, foreshadowing his Wendigo ending. Later in the cutscene, Josh will also affirm, I don't take orders from you, showing that the spirit of Hannah, or the spirits of Hannah and Beth, are routinely trying to make him come down into the mind, which may be the urging of Hannah. Josh then sees the large knife he used whilst in disguise as the psycho cut through a heaving mound of flesh to reveal the head of the pig, the pig he butchered to create the fake guts for his prank. This may be Josh viewing himself as a killer, regretting what he did to the animal, but you'll remember in the note just shown that he referred to Hannah and Beth as pigs, so when he kills the pig again here, it's further cementing that he killed them. Further evidence for this being more supernatural and kind of a call to the mind to become a Wendigo on the part of Josh is that exclusively Hannah's spirit peels back the flesh on her face to reveal the more gaunt, sallow, skeletal appearance she adopts as a Wendigo, and at the end of the vision, a large Wendigo head emerges from the pig's belly, the pig representing Hannah and Beth, but interestingly, Josh has never seen the Wendigo, so for his mind to conceptualize this, where's he getting this image from? So this is great, as with all things Josh, it can be approached from many different angles, it can be viewed as something that recontextualizes his actions and how he viewed the past, it can also be viewed as a piece of foreshadowing for his Wendigo ending. On top of that, it can be interpreted as either fully within his own head, or in part supernatural, the call of the Wendigo spirit. From here there are two endings for Josh, one where he fails to recognise Hannah and his head is crushed. This leaves him dead in the mind, the fate that he thinks befell his sisters, and a sibling killing him. He's had his insecurities about what he did to his siblings reflected back on him. So that's pretty tragic, but more tragic is Hannah being recognised by Josh, and then Josh is dragged off into the mind to become a Wendigo. Though Josh is family-centric, and this is maybe positive in that respect, it's overall very tragic, because Josh views himself as a killer, and he hates himself for it. So him becoming a Wendigo is just him realising the worst aspects of himself. It's him fully giving in to all of the trauma and guilt that has plagued him throughout the entire game. In summary, regarding Josh, 
I think he's a big part of what makes the game work because he is so multifaceted and they've taken elements from him in pretty much every other game they've made going forwards, be it the insanity plot twist in Little Hope or the transformation horror of his Wendigo ending in The Quarry. Josh is S tier, by the way, but it's not all about him. This video has been largely dedicated to him because I think he's the most interesting character to analyze and he makes up maybe a good 70% of why the cast works, if I'm being very generous. But I think the other characters all bring something unique to the game as well. The game has continued to have a success even past the era of this kind of game being the big thing because the cast are all so interesting and anyone can look at any of them and analyze their motivations and why they do things from really as many angles as they want obviously some are better than others but you're more than welcome to have any interpretation on these characters and i think all of them are special to someone in conclusion please don't butcher the movie please don't butcher the remaster just give me this again and i'll be very happy i know that's a pretty reductive take and people are allowed to make changes when they are remaking something but just give me this again please <laughs> that, that's all i'm asking for um and that's it from me so if you enjoyed this took a while to make so as i said at the start press the buttons if you've dedicated an hour of your life to this video you might as well dedicate another five minutes right and yeah hope to see you around next time leave any comments with suggestions of various horror topics to talk about because i've kind of run out of ideas after this <laughs> i'm not gonna lie <laughs> uh brain no worky have a good evening